Okay. I want to talk about. <laughs> yes, next slide. Oh, it's to network interconnectivity. Um, if I look at all of you, how many people have a network at home? What I mean is more than one computer. Oh, that's not bad. Do you use the network for both of those computers? No. No? Who uses IBM Peer? One, two, three. Yeah, if I say who doesn't use IBM Peer, you can all put your hands up, right? Are there any questions at all on IBM Peer? Otherwise, I will skip a part of my presentation. Well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be really quick. Okay. Um, the interconnectivity can be various things. We can talk about FTP, email, R-Sync. There are lots of other ways of connecting different computers to each other. And of course, we have peer-to-peer, -peer, be that IBM, peer services, or anything else. What are the characteristics of peer services? Well, basically, it is an approach in which all computers have the same responsibility. So we are not talking about a servant-client relationship, but each computer has exactly the same software running on it and doing exactly the same functions. Um, IBM File and Print Services started with the SMB, which is the server message block, which is still used today and is in fact the cornerstone of Windows networking. It works well, but it has poor security. That is our basic problem, I think, with IBM Peer. But if you're just using it at home, what's the problem? What's the problem? Well, a lot of the security issues only apply to Windows systems. <laughs> no, it's, it's true, it's true. That they usually find exploits to run Windows code yeah. on, but we're not on Windows. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, pre when we first had IBM Peer, we could connect to Windows machines and vice versa. So there was no real problem. Today, that doesn't really work. So. I just want to highlight a couple of things um, between um, the IBM file and print services and then we'll get on to the other part of the presentation. Um, one of the things you probably remember in ECS, you had the possibility, oh and here I use my, because I don't have a, um, oh I do have a mouse on the screen, I thought, ah, not bad but I don't see it myself. <laughs> no problem. Um, this, you remember, you saw this in ECS, and you could effectively fill in everything. And this was, in fact, a part of the post-installation phase of ECS. Now, if you ever need to do it again and you only have ECS, you can rerun this uh, part of uh, the installation which is a post-installation part, and you can do it by just running first command. There is the info. Um, if we have a look at Arca OS, there are some slight differences. To begin with, during installation, you have to select, and I'm sorry this is so poor quality here, but you have to select what you really want. Peer service is not automatically Include it. You have to select it. You also have to add NetBIOS over TCP if you want to do it on Arca OS. You probably don't see this on your installation because, like most people, when I do an installation, I'm pressing next, next, come on, get on with it. But there is information there. And what is that information? Well, basically, and I can't even read it myself here, it's about the password and user ID. You need to know that when you initially start up peer services.
So in Arca OS, you can just fill in, and here it is written, the username that you need to know, which is user ID, and the password. And if you don't know that, you're stuck. Because when you get into peer services, you can't do anything. Okay, let's start moving on. So, the defaults you need to do, user ID and password. The important thing is that you also need to configure your print services in Arca OS. I'm going to go on a bit higher. Sometimes you will get this situation in which you have your configuration screen and what you see is on the left hand side you have all these nice tabs and on the right hand side you don't. This is purely and simply because when you did a login you're not logged in with user with sorry administrator rights and then half of the stuff is missing. So if you see that you know what's the problem. I will skip all this unless there are we're going faster. A uh, couple of other differences between ARCA and ECS is that in the um, ECS version you have also a message service which is no longer available in ARCA OS. I don't know if anyone ever used the message service. No. Nope. It's, a, it's not installed in Arca OS. There's no, uh, well, you, if you find a command line for it, it should work, but. I mean, the, the objects should be there. The object's not there. We'll keep going through because I want to get on to. <laughs> um. In Peer, you also have the possibility of doing basic uh, sharing or customized sharing. Basic sharing is just you have access, you can read, and you can read and write, and that's it. Customized access, you have all these possibilities where you can say execute, read only, and so on and so forth. And this is basically what the access permissions you have. They are written as, I lose my, so you have as you, an N or an R, a W, C, all reasonable, but X for execute, A for attributes, and P for permissions. So you can then do complex shares, if you like. That's connections. This is all on the handout, so I will skip through this now to come to some things I want. Can anybody samba here? I can. Yes. Samba is the new solution. But what is Samba? Anybody know? Well, basically, it's free software re implementing the SMB network protocol. It is an acronym, almost. It gives us the possibility on OS2 to connect to. Windows, Linux, uh, Apple, whatever. I've only managed to connect to Windows because I don't, oh yes, and a Linux uh, system because I don't have any others. The name was originally SMB server, but of course, like most things, somebody else had that 
name already. So what did they do? They started looking for a word with SMB in it with a couple of things to get a word. And the first word they ever found was Samba. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the dance, but it's an easy way of giving something a new name, Samba. Or you can get your network swinging. You can keep your network swinging, exactly. Um, good morning. In OS2, and not only in OS2, there are effectively two parts to Samba. We have Arc Mapper, which is basically the client, which currently is at release 3.3.16. And we have the server. The server is about 3.625, depending on which version of Arc OS you have. If you have a, a, a beta version, there are slightly later versions in there. Please notice they're not at the same level, so this can give slight problems. Don't ask me which, because the problems I have met have nothing to do with the two differences, as far as I can tell. Arc Mapper, you can connect to another machine using the Arc Mapper and you connect to Windows, Linux, OS2. Arc Mapper, oh that's the next slide, sorry. <laughs> you find in the network folder on the desktop. Who uses Arc Mapper? Yeah. Happy? No. No. Yeah. I struggle always with that Arc Mapper. Okay. Well, maybe we'll get some questions later then. Um, Arc Mapper uses a virtual drive which is provided by NetDrive. You then have to mount or attach the, the virtual drive you attach to the system and the share you attached, sorry, you mount to the attached drive. One thing you might want to be careful about is a virtual drive can have more things mounted to them. So if you have a drive Z for example, you can mount various items, various machines to that drive. In some cases I've even managed to map or mount the same drive twice which is most confusing when you do a directory listing. Normally you will unmount a share of resource and then detach it when you want to get rid of it. NetDrive itself does not directly support printers, although printers you will find in ArcMapper. This is the typical client you will see. So if I open ArcMapper, I get on the right the ArcMapper GUI and you can start making your shares. Uh, there are possibilities, it's a really shame this is so poor quality, that you have a single share, all the shares on a server, or all servers in a work group. Keep it simple. At least when you're trying out in the beginning, Take a single share, don't make it difficult for yourself. Then you can select the server, which you will see here, which you will see here. Sorry, the server is this one, and these are the shares. Um, sometimes you will see shares, sometimes you won't. That depends a number of strange things. Um, my NAS, which is Linux, will always, I can see the shares. On my Windows machines, I have one where I will see no shares, and on the other one, I see the shares. They are both so-called at the same release level of Windows. Don't ask me what the difference is. I can't find it. You can then select your work group which is normally workgroup, 
and you have to enter then a user ID and a password. Now, if you're connecting to, uh, for example, a Windows machine, this is your username and your logon you used when you log on to the Windows machine. It's as simple as that. You need to select which virtual drive you're going to use. You get a list of available drives. Select one. And then all you have to do is press the button mount. And with a bit of luck, it is mounted. No errors, no nothing. It works. OK. Um, there is a, a strange button on the arc mapper called remove, which is here. You think, what am I removing? Well, the only thing you're removing is your input for your username and password. It's not really good. And there is a little lead there, this little green lead, which will go on once you've entered a number of characters. I don't know why. It doesn't seem to do anything. It looks like it's looking for the minimum number of characters, then it goes green. I've never seen it any other color than off, out, green, and that's it. Okay, mounting is in two parts. The virtual drive, which if you use a mount, will be automatically attached if the drive does not yet exist. And the mount point. Now, mount points are basically, if you like, subdirectories of the mount drive. To mount something, you can do select a particular share, which is here. This is my NAS at home. And then I can either press with the right hand mouse button, and it says mount, or I press the mount at the bottom. And then you will get the list where again you can select which drive you're going to mount this share to. You can mount read-only, which works. Um, the support for Keribus and um, other encryptions, it will in fact take the lowest first and then if necessary you can select other encryptions. Just use the standard encryptions for Windows, for uh, Linux, so there's no problem. It should connect. Of course, you will have to enter your name and password, your user ID and password. Personally, I keep the same username and password for everything because you can really get yourself confused and it makes things easier if you're testing and it works. There's another method of mounting a share, which is quite simple. Basically, you're going to... It's really bad screen, this, isn't it? I cannot... This is a button that says Enable. <laughs> On the printout, you can read it. But if you go to the drop-down list of File, you can then enable a particular share and what we in fact do is mount your share first, then via file, select auto start enable, and it will put this share in your auto start directory. So the next time you start up ArcMapper, automatically you have that share. It makes life easy. There's only one thing that um, ArcMapper expects a particular file to be present, and that is the ArcMap dot the NDC, which is basically used to store your share and log on information. The easy way is of course just to uh, save that share using file and save and then using the name arcmap.ndc. Okay, in the you have some tabs here at the top. Mm -hmm. 
this one is the network neighborhood and what you see here is I have two Windows PCs but there are no apparent shares and it's very difficult if you don't have a share name how do you mount a particular share it's chicken and egg right however if you look at my these are two Linux machines they are shown this is a, an OS2 machine you see a button here which expands and gives you all the various shares and you need to know the share name when you try to mount something okay on a Windows 10 machine how do you find the shares well there are various methods of course you can uh, use the SMB client this you can do on your OS2 machine and you use the minus L which means list and you put in the host name for example in my home I use home one that's one of the Windows machines then you have to use enter the user password and user ID what you see this is what you then get again unfortunate the I can see all the various shares in ArcMapper you have one option on the configuration page which says show hidden shares and these are the the dollar shares and, and so on and so forth and then you get a complete list of all the shares what I had let's go back unfortunately I'm glad now you can't read this because here is my name and my password in clear text because the system asked me to type it in and it shows it in clear text but if you trust your wife it's not a problem I suppose who does um, some Windows machines will not react to that command so you have to use the minus W option so you say <coughs> SMB client minus L host name minus W and the work group and with a bit of luck you will then get a list some Windows machines won't work with that either <laughs> it's really strange you have to use the minus N and this way you don't even have to enter a username and password and you will still get everything if you are lucky what I found on my system when looking around that there are various versions of SMB client on the system so if you just type in SBM client I'm never sure which one it's using yeah you can go and look at your path and everything but I mean which one am I using you can also type a min v on an SMB client it'll tell you the version number but they all seem to work slightly differently and I have an idea that every time I connect to my Windows PC that also works slightly differently that's life I suppose okay let's have a look at network neighborhood so as I said the Windows 10 shares are not always shown and you see the differences with the rest um, let me have a look you also have a tab connection details so if you've made a share and you've mounted it you can see what is in fact been mounted it's also shown in the left hand side of the screen with ArcMapper you get a status icon you get the virtual drive which has the share mounted to a work group if anything and the host of the server concerned which is in this so here you have in fact all the information you get the share name and the user that is using the share and you get an EA status which is either a 1 or a 0 1 is it is effective 0 it's not effective 
then if you have read or write access and a cache timeout which I really don't know what it does um, we also have global settings in our MacPa for authenticating for browsing uh, theoretically allows browsing to the user ID and password you have selected um, you have a you need to refresh the network yourself even if you have refresh automatically it doesn't really work that's why I say theoretically and you have the possibility to use a local master browser but one of the machines has to have that function in the network which one that is you can see if you do a listing of the shares and you'll see underscore MB and I forget the nest the rest of the name but I can correct that for you you can also have uh, show all special shares and the options and then you create the dollar dollar IPC shares so do you want that or not it's there uh, remember inactive connection so if you've connected something yesterday and you reconnect today it will show it there but not active store credentials until next reboot that's handy um, as I say I use the same password and username for everything so if I say remember it when I do another mount I don't have to retype them in every time they're there so use is easy But if you do a reboot, they're gone. It's pure in memory. There are other things you can do in the global settings, but well, you can switch on logging and log level, but well, I don't really use them. Uh, if you like, you can use mini icons, just less uh, desktop is used. Ah, a bug yeah there are bugs I ran into this one which um, is not very nice I selected an item using uh, a particular item here so you mark which share you want to go amount and then you can say select however I'd done this with another item earlier and I think I'm mounting the new item I am not it seems to remember the old item so effectively you get the wrong share mounted to your drive which depending on what you're doing is not very nice so be really careful when you're doing multiple mounts after each other you might be on the wrong host you'll be deleting the wrong file or what have you uh, Windows uh, this doesn't really apply too much nowadays but on some Windows 10 systems you had to good morning you had to enable SMB 1.0 uh, this can be done by t going to the uh, Windows machine and the Windows features and you can turn on and off the SMB 1.0 support so if you have a problem you might want to do that but the latest versions of Samba and ArcMapper we're using don't necessarily have this problem um, I also found my firewall and virus, sc virus scanner I'll do it in English virus scanner were also blocking my access to my Windows machine so when you're trying to connect and you have problems think about switching off the virus scanner switching off your firewall temporarily of course just to see if you can get it working okay that was the client now we have the server side yes one thing about Windows firewalls is that when you plug in a Windows laptop on Wi-Fi or on Ethernet you do get a pop-up in most cases asking if you want to treat it as a public or a home mm -hmm. network yeah. and if you treat it as public the firewall blocks file sharing yeah. 
yeah. just to take that into account. Can, yeah. And another thing in Windows 10, <coughs> uh, SMB1 is turned off after a short time, even if you enable this. You have to <laughs> re do that uh, several times uh, and use that connection, and then it might not turn it off. <laughs> well, I've had funny things always happening in Windows 10, especially after an update. Things that were working beforehand, even something simple like printing an A4 in landscape, all of a sudden it's turned to uh, the American format le of uh, legal size and everything shifts. So, well, okay, the server. The server is a little bit more complex. Um, first of all, if you're using IBM Peer, you need to turn off NetBIOS. If you don't do this, you can forget about using the server. Basically, uh, the client is using some of the ports that NetBIOS uses. So, Samba and IBM Peer cannot coexist. It's one or the other. Well, I don't think that's a problem. Yes? That's not true. Well, I couldn't get I it to work. Both, I have them both running on the same machine. You just have to run Hero for NetBIOS. Okay. <coughs> Useful to note. Oh, and there is maybe one other interesting hack that you could accomplish. Hack. Is, is by using a, and it's, I think it's not officially documented by IBM, but you might be able to get it working by uh, setting up an alias on your Ethernet adapter so that an you get alias. A second, a, a, a <laughs> <laughs> so, so that so that you get a second IP address. Okay. That yeah. might be possible yeah. manually. But the question is, do you need it? It's up to you. I I use one system or the other. One interesting thing I have found with but I'll come on to that later. Um, okay. Samba, we have a set of programs. There's the simple Samba Configuration Center, which is the SSCC. We have a Users and Groups program. We have, come on, a status, so we can see what's happening. We can reload the configuration. We can restart the server, or we can start the server, stop the server. All these items are in the Samba server GUI when you open up Samba server. And there are also some edit and config uh, possibilities. Okay, the simple Samba server configuration tool is what it says. It is a simple configuration tool. When run for the first time, and this was where I ran into a problem, it is, or it has, the option in the parameters, slash install. If you start it and think, oh, I'll go back and do it again later, the program will throw that away. And it will no longer start with install, but with config. So you try to install again, and you have a problem. You see a completely different screen. Simple enough, change to slash install. In fact, as far as I can see, the, the program only uses slash install. Anything else or nothing results in the configuration screen. So again, if you need to reinstall for some reason, don't forget to slash install. But make sure Samba is not running, otherwise uh, it doesn't work. So stop Samba and then change the configuration. Okay, so we said let's keep it simple and we select a simple install. You have the possibility to change to an advanced version. You will get this screen which basically is saying erase current SMB configuration, erase the back end, erase LM hosts and install using yum. Now, I select everything. Certainly if you're trying to do things and you want a clean slate and press continue. Now, you're sitting there and wondering what's happening because there's nothing worse when you press a button on a computer and you don't see anything happening. You immediately think 
there's something wrong. Well, in this case, it's yum. It's busy from the network, loading everything down. And this can take several minutes. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see that the yum install is busy and that's minimalized. Or you can use the control escape and you see in the list of active programs that yum is busy. So, and wait, and wait. You might get some messages, but eventually this will appear. And this is the screen which is very important because you have to put in your root password. You have to say, I'm the boss on what it's going to be. The username is always root. And you have to fill in your password twice. Uh, currently, the configuration is for a minimum of five characters. But you can change that if you wish. Leave the rest as is. It's doesn't have much sense to change it unless you have very particular configurations. Um, you can select one of two things. You can either say select the default configuration uh, or you can use the migrate peer configuration. What is the difference? It's very simple. Um, when you say create sh Samba shares it will map every drive on your machine to a Samba share. All directories, everything. If you use the migrate, it will take what you have originally specified using peer and use those shares. So, what do you want? You can, of course, modify it later. That's what I said. Okay. Uh, during the start you'll be informed that a guest has been added you'll be informed that a u the root has been added and it will ask you to add a user later press close you will also see during the installation that he has here create backend there are in fact two backends SMB password and TDB SAM, which are effectively the databases for your passwords and accounts. Which one you use is up to you. The default is TDB SAM, which, if I remember, is a trivial database uh, and it's supported. It's a binary based database file. The SMB password I shouldn't use because that is being obsoleted by the Samba company. There is a third one but it's not used in OS2. So TDB SAM. We have three server main types. Hey I've got my mouse back again. <laughs> this is nice. Uh, the standalone server, domain controller, or a member server. We only have in OS2 the standalone and the domain controller. Configuration tabs in Samba. If you go and select, and this is effectively global, which unfortunately you can't really read, so if you just select this, you will get on the right hand side all the various possible selections uh, work group, the machine number and uh, for example some text which you will see on another machine when you open up that particular uh, host so if the host is an OS2 machine running Samba that is the text you will see in the net um yeah there's two tabs if you're really crazy you can go to the expert mode and you've got 29 tabs to play around with well i kept it simple i'm lazy but 
basically they are things like uh, transmission, uh, timeouts, speeds and so on and so forth. Uh, the only thing you want to do there is nothing unless you're really having problems and you know what you're doing, which most of us don't. I'm speaking for myself, of course. All the information is, however, stored in the Samba configuration file, smb.conf. And it'll be stored in a global section. Um, that file is divided into global, homes, printers, and shares. The share will just be the name of the share itself. So if you have, for example, home one as one of the shares, home two as another share, you will see in the configuration file, home one and then information over the share itself. This is an example. And what you can see is, uh, this is the global, you see some password, guest account, user, and this goes on and on. But what you see in the file is exactly what you can adjust in the simple configuration tool. But it's there if you want to read it. Um, home directories, and then you start getting the shares. This is one of the options you have um, in the configuration on, uh, I think it's on the second tab, where you can hide particular files if you wish. And uh, somebody said on the internet somewhere, oh, then I can get rid of all those lousy Macintosh shares that keep listing everything. Here you see a printer is also in there. This is my printer. I haven't looked further than that. And another drive. Okay. Users. That's the next thing you need to do once you've got Samba up and running. You start to define your users. Well, you already have the root. And you can go and change anything using the Samba users and group. You'll need to put in the root password and the username. Sometimes it will give you an error message because here's instead of root for some reason you have user and it says this is not allowed and it changes it to root automatically and then you fill in your password. But Okay here you can create users, edit users, delete a user. Join a user to a group doesn't work not by me. You had any success? No. Okay, thank God. <laughs> it's not just me. Or leave a group. Uh, same options are available with the right hand mouse button. But this is so often the case in OS2. We have more ways to roam. And sometimes they are better. In the user dialog, did you have this uh, problem with German language? Well, you can specify the user and his name, you can give some more info, but then the account description. Now for our German friends, this is easy. Uh, there is Standard, standard Benutzer, Alternativ Benutzer Konto, Administra Konto and a Gast Konto. And why it is in German, I don't know, because everything on my system says EN, English. Okay, I think it's Mergel again. She's uh, been difficult. <laughs> it was developed in Germany, yeah. <laughs> Bitwise Works did some stuff on this. Okay. Uh, you get various things like uh, home directory and uh, user IDs, but okay. There's also allowed to use swap. Let's go on here. So name. Or if you're a Calib user, yeah. Uh, there are two uh, types of users in the uh, database. One is a Calib user and the others are non-Calib users. I don't really know what it does. Does anyone? Okay, 
Then account types, uh, I've put the names now in English. <laughs> so for the non-German speakers, your password and SWOT. SWOT is a Samba web administration tool. Uh, as far as I know, it doesn't work with OS2. You used it, Greg? No? Okay. Uh, you can edit a user from the GUI, change passwords, and so on and so forth. Um, the profile is only just showing you, you can't edit in anything in it. So this is just info. Again, just info in the various tabs. You do have uh, a button called PB Edit. This is a method of editing your database. So effectively, you should be able to change the options by using that console. That is a program on itself with lovely options, which I do not you know. Uh, groups dialog, you would expect you can create and delete a group. Doesn't work. Map or unmap a Calib group to the Samba group. Doesn't work. Uh, you can make a restoration script, which makes, in fact, a command with the various things you should make a group with. But it doesn't work, at least not for me. And you've got the same thing happening with the right-hand mouse button. If you wish, you can show only Samba groups. All this does is the very first one is, in fact, a Klib group. That's the root. It just doesn't show it. So, I don't know. Policies. Oh, these are nice. You, these are functions to say, for example, uh, if you logged on, how often you can uh, try once, twice, three times. It should then block the system. Well, there are lots of these things you might want to play with. You can here do the minimum password length, if you wish. The default is five. So for us home users, this is not really interesting. But it's there. And I can imagine if some people use Samba for more things as in business, they would want to arrange some of these functions. OK, this is all the various options still left, quite a few. And some of them are not really obvious what they're doing. Um, we also have a remote procedure call console, another option within Samba. And the, apart from the remote procedure call console, you also have save, refresh, and help. The Remote Procedure Call Console, um, if you want to know anything about it, use this link and it will give you more info. Um, one of the tabs is flags. Um, I eventually found out what they were. And some things look quite obvious, N, no password, the account disabled, and so on. So it gives you more information about a particular share you have on the system. Uh, X means password does not expire. And you get multiples. It's very difficult to see here. You have user, and you often have UX. Why should your password expire? I can only remember one password at a time. If I have to have more, it won't work. Um, by default, neither of these programs, either ArcMapper or the Samba server, start automatically. In ArcMapper, you can easily do this. You can go to the Auto Start in File and click Enable.
if necessary, you can delay the enabling. So if you go to the startup folder, look for Arc Mapper there, and look at the parameters, you can add minus delay and then some delay in seconds. I always delay it about 20 seconds. The problem is that when anything starts in the startup folder, at that moment in time, the TCP IP stack is being created. So if you're too quick, the first share in your arc mapper fails and the next two will be okay. Which is frustrating, so, so put a small delay in. See what works for you. Um, don't forget to put something in the arc map NDC, otherwise it'll give an error. You need to say when you start up if you're going to load anything or not. Okay, the Samba server itself has two daemons which are started by the command smb.command. You can either use the GUI and the icon start and it will start it or you can go into the status and there's a button there which says start and you can start the daemons and you see that they are running. That's nice because then you know something's happened. Uh, Samba script you can add because if you put uh, the start uh, Samba server program in your startup folder it will also try to start immediately. There is um, a small wait on DHCP I've seen in that command but well just put a small uh, delay in. Oh yeah, back, 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 back. So I'm see, I'm missing something. Oh, this is a duplicate slide, I think. Sorry. Okay, performance. You may have been um, reading on internet that the performance of Samba is not so great. I tried this. Um, unfortunately. I have a problem that I cannot connect a Samba to a Samba machine. In my home situation, if I have one of those machines on, it blocks the other one. Really strange. But anyway, what I have done is I copied a big file from Windows 10 to Samba. So from the Windows machine, it took 24 Point 0.9 seconds. I got this speed. I went the other way around and from my Samba machine to the Windows 10. Slightly higher. What was interesting if, and these are the same machines actually, only then running Arca or uh, Windows, if I do Windows to Windows, the speed is almost double. Uh, what is interesting enough, going back and forth, there are no differences. Now, I cannot say that this is 100% because I have various disks in my machine. Um, NTFS is different from JFS, but there are definitely differences. But so what? It works perfectly. Some things to know. Well, if you're copying files across a network, EAs are not always copied. It might not be important. Realize that not every file system supports EAs. My NAS, which is using a Linux version, I cannot enable EAs in it. Although in Linux, it is possible to enable EAs. So, uh, OS2 file names are case sensitive. So, if you copy a file with uh, capitals, for example, I've got two files here. They look the same on the OS2, 
but on another system they are not. Strangely, and, and this was confusing me for a long time, I kept deleting in a file and I kept finding him back again. And it's basically because the name I thought was the same. If you go into a command line on OS2 and you list via the share those files, you will see that are two different names. Even on my PC, I had two different names. But if you look in the GUI, you only find one name. So although the command line does show you the difference, differences, you don't see them in the GUI. Be careful. It's a strange fault, but okay. Uh, what's happening? Well, uh, currently, Samba 4 client is at 5.038. The versions we have, uh, ArcMapper are 3 and the server are version 3. But ArcOS has in their latest beta release a version of the Samba 4 client. I haven't yet tried it. Um, the client is available from Arca OS, as is the Heimdall plugin, and they've also improved the NetDrive plugin. I have no idea what's happening on the server side, but uh, we will see Sylvan uh, later today from Bitwise Works, and maybe we can ask him what is happening there. Um, just for your info, the current release on Samba from the Samba group themselves is at 4.1. That was released last March. The Samba group does a release approximately every six months, an update. The biggest difference, I think, between uh, release 3 and release 4 is for Active Directory on Windows. For us, well, it'd be nice, but I can connect to my Windows machine at home. I can get files back and forth. It does what I want to do. Um, this is a stop press I got from Lewis. First of all, greetings and happy Warp Stop weekend to all of you. That he said. And he had said that the following packages have just been added to the Arc Noah repository and these are the Heimdall updates. Uh, basically the problem was there were two security issues in the Heimdall version that we used. Well not only we but uh, other people as well. So that's really stop press. The current implementation of OS2 Samba is incomplete. The installation is a lot better than a couple of years ago. My biggest problem was there are absolutely no help files. When you press the help button, the only thing you do get is some little hints at the bottom of the GUI saying what it's doing. But that's it. There are a lot of options associated with these programs. PBEdit, RPC, SWAT, and so on. It's complex. It works well enough for most people. It works for me. Um, as I said, the current version, because we're using release 3 of Samba, doesn't support Active Directory. I've tried most of the options, but I do not have enough knowledge to know if they're really working or not. I can only tell you the things I found that didn't work. However, it provides us in OS2 with the possibility and the capability to connect to most other networks. And I think that is the most important thing. Um, here are some foods for thought. You can start reading everything you want about Samba. The Samba user documentation is online, it's version 
2, I think. Uh, they have a version 3 online, but then you have to subscribe to it. But I found the documentation in far, uh, insofar as it uh, is there is very good, but it doesn't always tell you things you want to know. <laughs> but what's new in documentation, guys? Okay, questions. Now's your chance. Fire away. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Experiences? One thing I've noticed with certain network routers at home is that the ISP uh, somehow configures the router in such a fashion that your LAN inside gets an external IP address of uh, the ISP. There's just one thing that screws things up sometimes is that uh, certain, in some, for example, a Fritz box has a built in list of devices with the NetBIOS name. And in some cases that's used for file and print sharing. The result is that when you try and browse a network and it's set to an external DNS, you don't get any of the uh, devices listed. And when you then change the router to give the DNS address of your local router, they do suddenly appear in the, in the list sometimes. So that's something you might want to look at. It might be an effect of uh, the primary um, uh, the master browser yeah. issue. The thing that's first booted up was either uh, usually a NAS or uh, yeah. even in more cases the router. Uh, that's true. Is, uh, um, gets a master browser and yeah. in some cases if you reboot that thing, um, another uh, unknowing thing. Yeah. Well, gets in, my in my case, because my NAS is always on, that is the master browser. But as I said, if you go and look at the shares using SBM client and you go listing the various um, hosts, you will come with one which says underscore MB browse, I think it is, and underscore. That's then the master browser. In my case, it's always the NAS because it's on. Actually, what happens is when you boot up, all the computers are shouting at each other and one says, I'm the boss and says, I'm the master browser. And which one that is? Well, it's generally the one that first comes up or the one that's been on the longest. And my other machines, I switch off now and then. Okay, gentlemen. Any more questions? Last chance. Buy your tickets now. Well, if there are no other questions, I thank you. I hope... I may have helped you a little bit with this presentation. Um, on the website, the complete presentation, including everything about IBM Peer is there, I thought. Well, then we have a complete list of everything. If you have any questions later, you know where to find me. If you have questions in the future, I won't give you my telephone number. <laughs> but seriously... I've got this number. <laughs> If there's anything else, you know where to find me. Thank you.